So this webinar is intended to give greater insight into the significance of economic geology and the pivotal role that it plays within our modern society. To some, this may seem a foregone conclusion, but for others, we have an important task. In a sense, I think the question we are really asking or really attempting to answer is, why should anyone care about economic geology? Mining may seem a relic of the past, leaving future generations to clean up its legacy, but society's future and the future of mining are now inexorably linked. Before we can look to mining's future, we need to understand where we are now and how we got here. Summarizing the history of economic geology over the past 100 years and placing it into the context of current demand, our first speaker, John Thompson, will illustrate how today's need for metals is being driven by global energy transition and climate change. The other side of the central question, why do we care about mining is, does mining care about us? It would be all too easy, I think, to look at the industry and see nothing but a bottom line. But we are answerable to society at large and the increasing importance of environmental, social, and governance, ESG, in the resource industry demands that. Our second speaker, Sarah Gordon, will explore the evolution and future of ESG which, within the context of economic geology, showing that sustainable mining operations are possible and that within the partner with proper partnerships and oversight, the exploration industry has potential to deliver huge social, financial, and even environmental value back to society. I'm Lauren Zeke, I'm your moderator. I'm a PhD candidate at Colorado School of Mines and the current chair of the SEG Students Committee. A brief webinar agenda, first the introduction. Second, our presentations, first by John Thompson and Sarah Gordon, then a Q&A with the audience, and, and then last, our closing comments. Since 2012, John has partnered in a consulting business based in Vancouver, BC, focused on exploration, mining, innovation, and sustainability. He is the Honorary Professor of Responsible Resources at the University of Bristol, UK, and previously was the World Professor of Environmental Balance for Human Sustainability at Cornell University. He was Chief Geoscientist at Tech Resources, 1998 to 2005, and Vice President, Technology and Development, 2005 to 2012. In the latter role, he was responsible for innovation and technology-related transactions. Prior to tech, John directed the Mineral Deposit Research Unit, MDRU, at the University of British Columbia. John has held diverse leadership roles in many organizations, including Genome BC, the World's Economic Forum, Resources for Future Generations 2018, and the Society of Economic Geologists. He was a co-founder of both Geoscience BC and the Canada Mining Innovation Council. He is a director of Co Cobalt Metals and MindSense, a co-founder of Regeneration, and his advisory roles for several exploration technology, venture capital, and research organizations. Without further ado, John, take it away. All right. So thank you very much, Lauren, and thanks for that long introduction. Um, at least some of it's true. Um, and thank you also for introducing the topic. I think you know putting economic geology in the context of the world and what the world needs is a, is absolutely a vital thing. And hopefully, I'm going to touch on some of that in the next uh, thirty minutes or so. And what I don't touch on, I'm confident Sarah will do a wonderful job of following me. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, um, okay, I can share my screen. I hope. Here we go. So that you should be seeing my screen now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about economic geology for a sustainable world, and I'm going to really touch on three different uh, key points in this in this talk. And hopefully, if I can advance my slides, these are the three points I'm going to talk about. So it's pretty much an, uh, ten minutes on each one. So if you're tracking my time, you'll know how well I'm doing. So I'm going to talk about metals in the energy transition. Pretty much about demand, where we've come from as a world, what's driving demand right now, what we should and shouldn't be concerned about. Then I'm going to talk about economic geology, a little bit about how it has evolved and is evolving. And there's no question that evolutionary process is very significant to the discipline and again to, to, to the world at large. 
And I'm going to finish up by talking about some, some of the things that are changing right now for economic geology, for mineral exploration, some of the new and emerging opportunities and what that means potentially for economic geologists. So we're going to start with the, with the metals demand. And there's a long history of demand. It dates back to the Industrial Revolution you know, in the 1700s to 1900s, which was about mechanization, power generation, and transportation. Come the 1900s, we went into a massive infrastructure growth, followed by two world wars, disastrous world wars in many respects, obviously, for humanity, but led to an incredible increase in the amount of materials that we use and the development of vast numbers of technology, particularly in the Second World War. And that heralded then this period of some big science and technology in the latter part of the 2000s. And we closed out that century, the 20th century, with an incredible build out in the developing world led by China that went through to the, you know, to the 2015 thereabouts. And it's ongoing, but the, the, the massive phase of build out happened really in the, in the early part of the 2000s. And what did that translate into? This is the curve that I've drawn on here. And it's obviously a more or less an exponential growth in population, which we know about, which fortunately is showing signs of actually declining now. But more importantly for the world, massive increase in energy consumption, energy use, and attendant greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2, and then resources, metals that went along with it. So as we ended that period, you know, we were already on track to producing a very significant amount of metals to meet humanity's needs and desires. So just to emphasize that this uh, that statement and those curves weren't made up, here's a few little graphs. This is energy over 100 years, and you can see the exponential rise in energy use and energy demand, and a parallel, paralleling that CO2 emissions. So anybody who disputes that there's a relationship between those two, two graphs probably needs to, needs to think again. And over here on the left is the equivalent graph for metals. And as you can see, a significant increase, particularly for the major metals, copper, zinc, and iron, or steel in this case, over that, uh, in this case, a 50-year 50 50 period, more or less exponential increase in demand for, the, for those, uh, those products. On top of that now, we layer this new thing called the energy transition, and that's efforts really to mitigate climate change by changing the way we produce energy, that's renewable energy, and the way we, we use it through electrification, particularly electric vehicles. So on this slide, this is, these are three graphs for three, three of these metals, copper, lithium, and cobalt, predicted by the uh, International Energy Agency for changes in demand from 2020 to 2030. So that's a 10-year period. That's not very long. We're, we're, you know, we're a third, almost a third of the way through that period. And you can see that they're predicting very significant increases, particularly if we go to the full-out effort to meet a sustainable world with a one-and-a-half to two-degree cap by 2050, the amount of renewable energy and electrification we need to do gives us these red curves on these diagrams. So we can see a big gap, apparent gap emerging for copper supply, an even bigger one for lithium and a substantial one for, for cobalt. And that's just to meet the, the energy transition. Now, if we take a less aggressive approach, a sort of more like the stated policy, as they say here, then these yellow curves are the likely curves. So the gaps still appear, but they're not quite as dramatic as the gaps if we go full on to meet, uh, to meet our climate change targets. So this is a pretty, pretty stark scenario. Many people have drawn attention to this and worried about where we're going to get these metals from. And of course, those were just three metals, but what about the rest of the periodic table, which I'm showing here? And on here, I'm showing the, the elements that are particularly important for the, the green economy, the, the uh, energy transition, technology metals, if you like, they're the ones highlighted in yellow. And then the ones circled by the, the white line are those which are regarded as critical. And the critical definition is uh, are the, the metals, the, the elements, that are either jurisdictionally challenged, i.e. they're produced largely by a single jurisdiction and one that we may not regard as entirely friendly, and or there's other challenges around their, 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 their supply. So we feel that we won't be able to easily access the, the elements that are shown with the white circle. Now, every country has a slightly different definition because every country's needs are different and they have different amounts of supply they can get. So the critical mineral list for Europe and North America and Australia are slightly different, but there's obviously a significant amount of overlap between them. And the other thing that's important to remember is these are dynamic. So if things change, an element can suddenly we get new supply, it becomes less critical. Others get into more difficult situations with a restricted supply, they're going to become crit critical. It's, it's not just about where they're coming from. The problem is 
that as they get into the market, the supply chain, the early part of the supply chain, they come in through different means, these elements. So some are produced as a single product or a co-product from a mine. So lithium would be a good example here, but lithium that's produced from pegmatites or brines, that's their sole job is to do that. But many of these products, the ones circled in blue here on the periodic table, are byproducts of mining. So they are not the sole product or even the main product of a mine, they're much, very much a byproduct. And finally, those circled in black are byproducts of smelting and refining. We don't even see them in the economics of a mine. They appear in the economics of the smelter and refinery. So we're well down now the supply chain. And what that means is that these, the supply of all the elements that are circled in blue and black are what we would describe as inelastic. And that means that we can't just quickly add more supply from those, those, uh, for those, of those metals because their supply is contingent on increasing the major product that drives their production. And that makes it very difficult to manage. And that's another reason why some of these elements are critical is because there's just not enough scope to rapidly increase the supply of them in some cases. So this is a more recent graph. This is a very recent graph, October 2022, produced by Fitch Ratings, which just shows five elements. And these are the critical ones for electrification, particularly for batteries. So it's aluminum or aluminum at the bottom, copper, nickel, cobalt, and lithium at the top. And you can note that the scale is the same for four of these metals, cobalt, nickel, copper, and aluminum, but is different and much larger for lithium. So the amount of additional supply of lithium is very, very significant if we're going to meet full electrification of vehicles going forward to, to, to 2050. So these are, again, very significant growth rates. And this, the question is raised, as it was by that previous, those previous graphs from the IEA, is can we, can we, can we do that? Can we meet this kind of uh, this projected growth out to 2050? So, in a recent paper that was just published, uh, literally a few weeks ago, by Gent et al., they looked particularly at cobalt in the context of batteries, noting that cobalt is a very, very significant element in batteries. It accounts for about 10 to 20 percent of cathodes currently in electric vehicle batteries. But they looked at the, the, the current supply rates and concluded that actually if we maintain the growth in supply of cobalt, we can actually meet the kind of challenge that's shown on the graph on the right. So it's not all despondency. If things go well and we keep performing as an industry, we can probably meet that, uh, that increased demand. So why do they say that? What's the, what's the basis of that kind of conclusion? So one of the bases is shown in the graph here on the right. This is a graph from uh, Jowett et al. in 2020 that looked at, in this paper, at this particular graph, it looks at copper. And what you can see is production of copper growing from 1994 through to 2020, steady growth in production. Now, most people don't know anything about the mining industry would assume if we keep increasing production, we'd get a run out and we can't keep doing that. It's impossible to keep just increasing more and more production. But you look at the black line at the bottom of this graph, this is the reserve number, and the reserves have actually increased, not parallel to the production, but continuously through this period of production. And that actually included this massive build out in China from about so 2000 to 2015 here. So this kind of period here, that, that was China's growth, incredible amount of increased consumption of copper, but we met it. And we kept producing more, adding more reserves, and the actual production to reserve ratio was pretty flat. It did dip a little bit through this pit build out in China, but it basically managed to maintain a pretty flat scenario. And again, Gent et al. looked at the same kind of data for 15 different metals, and the same story holds for, for other metals as well. So why is that? And the simple answer is we've always managed to increase reserves, even when we've had predicted supply gaps out in front of us. And the reason for that is we're good at it. We're good at converting resources to reserves as a mining industry. And we're good at expanding our resources and finding more resources and making some discoveries. Although discovery rates have declined, we still manage to expand resources in and around our existing mines to meet this increased demand. But there's a caveat. And the caveat is, is, is the word quality. To, increase, to achieve that increase of uh, resources and reserves, and expand our mines and expand production, we're tending to mine deposits that have lower and lower grades. So we're decreasing the cutoff of our, our metals. And in effect, we are producing less metal while moving more and more rock. And that's not a good scenario. It's not a good scenario for a sustainable world. It's not a good scenario for the production of these commodities, because at some point that's going to become more and more difficult to do. And when is that? That's the question. And that then comes so fully into impact when we think about the other challenges that the mining industry faces, that's the ESG, 
environment social governance challenges. And these are things like jurisdictional restrictions, the community relations and benefits for communities. It's our access to land, competition from the land from different people. It's our emissions of greenhouse gases related to our energy consumption, our use of water, waste, et cetera, and environment biodiversity. All of these things are major challenges. And if we don't address those challenges, what happens? We don't get to mine. We have uh, objections from people on the ground, people object in, in society, consumers start to object. People will not let us proceed as business as usual if we can't do a much, much better job around these, uh, these supply challenges. So yes, we can meet the demand for metals, but we have to do it in a better way and we have to be focused on quality. And finally, just on this story, I want to add one other kind of dimension, and that's we live in a volatile and complex world. So just as we see this incredible need for our metals, demand going out to 2050 in order to beat electrification, et cetera, et cetera, we're in, right now in a period of pretty extreme volatility. In fact, the copper price shown on the right here dropped significantly in the latter part of this year, and predictions are that it may drop even further next year. So just as we need more, we need people to invest in copper, the prices are telling people don't invest because things aren't looking so good. And of course, that reflects China's attitudes or the American-US-China relationship, Russian-Ukraine war, you know, disastrous consequences for people, but also for, for commodities, and of course, potentially a recession and so on that may, may come. And so all of this is just going to make it more difficult to do the difficult job that we already have. Oops, sorry. So here, this is a little summary of the, my first part of my talk here. You can think of this as a sort of balancing act between the society, the metal demand that we need for a sustainable world and to meet the needs of, of human beings and electrification and sustainable development and so on, versus the need to do the job properly to give social benefits to everybody who's involved in our mining enterprise and achieve something that, that we might think of as net zero impact. So we want to have impacts that will be impacts, but we want them to zero out to be in balance with the environment in balance with society. And how do we do that? We have to come back to this word here, quality. It's not just about quantity. It's not just about lowering the grade and producing more metal. It's about doing it from better deposits. So the role of economic geology, how does that fit into this picture? Of course, in my view, I'm biased, but I would say front and center. So here's a quick snapshot of 100, 120 years of economic geology. From the early 1900s as prospectors, and early geological engineers, and many people were cross-disciplinary back in the early part of the 1900s. Through the build-out of technology, that science piece of the puzzle and the contribution of technology from World War II, new deposit models, and into the digital world. And so what's this growth look like? It's growth really in data, massive growth in data. There has been growth in discovery. Perhaps some would argue less than we need and, and less perhaps than we used to, but still significant zero. And without doubt, we've seen increases in reserves. So it's all about now thinking about mineral systems. Now, the concept of a mineral system is not a new idea. We've been in a way working on mineral systems for, for, for many years, probably the last 50 years. But the focus on it now is a little different. It has driven home how we need to really understand the full dimensions of a mineral system from its sort of energy driver through how things, metals and associated media, whether they be magmas or fluids, transport these metals and their eventual deposition or concentration in a trap, which is the deposit. And the key to note is that, that everything as shown here, those three main factors operate at different scales. And we need to understand all three scales if we're going to be effective as explorers. <clears throat> now, if you think of science, science has tended to focus obviously on the deposits. There have been many detailed studies on individual deposits. Many graduate students have cut their teeth literally by working on a deposit. So a big thick arrow for deposits. But a lot of work has been done on understanding source and thinking about source and drivers at the big scale. I would argue a little less work has been done about transportation and this intermediate kind of camp scale or district scale understanding of, of, of economic geology. In contrast, if we think about the business, the exploration business, obviously they focus on the deposit, but they are equally focused on the camp scale or trying to understand the camp scale and perhaps a little less worried about source and where things come from, although that perhaps isn't changing a little bit. So if we take that sort of picture of a mineral system, we can then look at the kind of key things, the key challenges that relate to whether we can find quality ore bodies, gain quality ore bodies that allow us to do responsible mining with maximum benefits and minimum impact, the kind of net zero concept 
for emissions, effluent, biodiversity, heritage, etc. So again, we can divide into these three pieces. The regional piece, we have to be exploring, focusing our efforts in the areas where we're most likely to succeed. There's no point spending billions of dollars in an area that's going to produce very little in the way of metal production. We then have to get into the camp. And now once we work at the camp scale, we have to understand timing, tectonics, structure, basins, fluids and fluid flow. And we need to piece those pieces together such that we can understand them and use them as vectors to our potential sites of mineralization. And then once we're into the deposits, we're understanding the details of the deposits and how to expand them again using vectors, looking at zoning and so on. And this, this transition here from regional to district to deposit is really downscale, is really an increase of data. We just get more and more data. And of course, that opens up opportunities for different tools, different types of data science, whether we're working regionally or at a district scale or at the deposit scale. Having found the deposit, then we need to understand it, because if we can understand it better, we can use our knowledge of the ore deposit to, to produce, to mine and produce metals more effectively. So this piece is very important, and it operates also at multiple scales across the ore body, from the, the tens of meters, or hundreds of meters, down to the micron scale, as we try to work out how to better get the metals out of the rocks with a minimum amount of energy. And science plays a role across all of these areas, economic geology being the lead science in the development of the understanding of all three scales. So I drew this cartoon a few years ago. I drew a geologist and he or she was out in the field looking at the rocks with all these fancy tools. And of course, all those tools already exist now. I was just a little, hadn't woken up to the fact. And so what I show here is really is the modern world. We are surrounded by tools. They may not look exactly the way I depicted them, but we're surrounded by different tools that we take into the field. And the bottom line here is, is not that it's changed what we do when we look at rocks, but it's vastly changed the amount of data that we can acquire in essentially real time, whether it's through handhold tools or drones or whatever, we're acquiring more and more data. And again, what does that tell us? It tells us we need to be able to work with the data, and that's the role of, the role of data science. So that takes me to the third part of what I'm going to talk about. I really want to now finish up by thinking about economic geology and where, where it's heading. And so I'm going to talk about six things here very briefly. I'll touch on two or three of them in a little more detail. So that concept I talked about with all this data, that's enhanced exploration. It's a combination of geoscience and data science now. And the, our ability to marry those things to, together, the traditional way we work with the new way we could, ways that we can work with data, again, be key to our success. Once we have deposits, I mentioned before, it's about understanding them. That's the term all body knowledge that people use a lot now. If we understand the deposit, then we could do things like ore sorting. We can be more selective about how we mine it. And that's again, a data science story. We need new sources. We, it's great to, that we love to explore our favorite deposits, whether it's porphyry deposits, VMS, gold, what different types of epithermal gold, whatever it may be. We love our deposits, we kind of grow up working with them and understanding them, but we knew, need new and more different sources to fill in that, uh, that supply gaps that we may see in the future. And that's going to take new models and new understanding. We're probably going to have to work with waste more effectively, both to make, get full value out of our mines, but also to recover additional metal that's probably just sitting there waiting for us to, to, to work with and so on. So processing and linking processing of those metals, recover those metals to ultimate reclamation of mine sites is a good and emerging thing. We need to incorporate all the knowledge we have, not just our scientific knowledge, but even traditional knowledge from indigenous people and others who have a different perspective than we do and may help us understand the things we're looking at. And that leads us in then to, in our turn, understanding better the communities and the people we work with, and then building that into our understanding of prospectivity. What can we really develop and where should we focus our efforts? And lastly, there'll be a lot of new science emerging and coming into our business. And I just picked one here, which is the role of geomicrobiology. There is no question in my mind that this is going to have massive impact on our mining, on the miners, just as it will on other areas. And the efforts here where I live at the University of British Columbia to map the microorganisms that are present across the mining space is an example of the kind of work that's going to lead to some interesting and new results. So a few quick examples. So I mentioned data science and earth science. So this is a picture of a company working in very far the northern part of Quebec in Northern Canada, an area which has a very short field season, two, three months maximum. So you have to try and get a, a lot of work done as efficiently as possible. And what this company has been doing, they've been working in the field, this is cobalt metals, they've been working in the field and the geologist has gone out 
made observations, collected data, used handheld held XRF, et cetera, et cetera. And that data has been transferred overnight back to the head office, where it has been reiterated in the model. So that the next morning when the geologist wakes up, the geologist gets told, don't do that, Travers. Do this, Travers, because the hypothesis in this Travers is more important and more easily tested than that one. So it's real-time decision-making in terms of actually developing the program. And that what greatly increases the efficiency of the exploration effort here, again, given a very short field season. Traditionally, you do all the work over a summer, go home, spend nine months thinking about it, realize you were in the wrong place, and come back a year later to start all over again. And doing it this way, using and utilizing communication and data science allows this to be a much more efficient process. All body knowledge. As I mentioned, there's a whole array of tests. This is a, a slide from Regina Baumgartner showing all these different tests from hundreds of meters scale down to the micron scale. And earth scientists and economic geologists play a vital role in both implementing these tests and then working out which ones are most important for different applications. And that requires collaboration with mineral processors and metallurgists to see how we can translate these kinds of information into how the material may be mined, mined and processed. And of course, it has to be tested, it has to be piloted and tested using a, a range of different tools. Um, this is a vital role for economic geologists. It's right at the pointy end. It's data, data rich, but very exciting for those people who want to get involved in this. If we understand the ore body, as I mentioned, that allows us to do ore sorting. And this is an example of bulk sorting where the, the, there's a detector on the, on the shovel here which is detecting the copper content of the material in the bucket as it is being, is being mined. So this is great information by the bucket. What it means is that they can decide whether this, this is ore or waste. And effectively, it means that they can recover ore from waste. And normally waste, once it's labeled as waste in the mine plan, it goes just to the dump, it's, it's waste. But using this technology, they can recover ore from waste and there's often ore in amongst the waste material. And then they can also, remove waste from ore, and that effectively lifts the, the, the grade up because you've taken some of the material out of it. And this is good for the energy of communication, for grinding and so on, you're using less energy. You're essentially addressing that problem I raised for, before of getting less metal from more rock, and you're turning it around and trying to get more metal from less rock. And this is a good thing. And the other thing that's really cool about this technology is now we have grade information by the bucket, and you can back that into the ore body model and see how well it represents what sort of variability is represented by this information. This is a whole new data set that we've never had before. So this is the application of all body knowledge to create value and to create new knowledge. And earth scientists and economic geologists play a vital role in this company. This is a company that involves data scientists and engineers and other people, but the, the, the economic geologists in this, uh, in this company are vitally important. And lastly, I want to mention new sources. Well, it's not last, I've got two more actually. I want to talk a little bit about the new sources and challenges. So there's high profile and a lot of attention has been paid to the potential of nodules on the Pacific and the Pacific out in the Clarence Clipperton zone and their potential to deliver copper, nickel, cobalt, et cetera, uh, to the market. And uh, this is you know, approaching a stage where people are beginning to think about trial mining and so on. Although there's considerable concern still, it's fair to say about the environment in the deep ocean and how effectively we're going to be recovering the metals uh, once we pull them off the, off the seafloor. But undoubtedly a very, very significant resource. And again, an exciting opportunity for some economic geologists. At a completely different level now, so that's deep in the ocean, is we have the deep crust. We tend to be a little shy of working in rocks, highly metamorphosed terrains and the, the rocks that represent the deep crust. And yet there are some very significant deposits that not only occur in those, so they may be metamorphosed deposits, that are now in those rocks, but there may be deposits that are actually formed under those conditions. And here's a couple of examples. This one in the middle here is Nova Bollinger in the Fraser Zone in Western Australia, a significant nickel copper cobalt deposit formed at significant uh, PT conditions. And then a series of copper deposits that occur in the Curacao Valley, currently being mined by, by Era Copper. Again, very similar conditions here for formation, we believe, as that occurred at Nova Bollinger. And this kind of is opening up new areas and new ways to think about it. And these were highlighted by this paper by Bidgood and Hitzman, who looked at a number of different potential sources and different ways we might uh, think about uh, targets in the future. So this is quite, I think, an exciting and a rather unappreciated uh, area for further work. I mentioned that we need to get metal from waste and tailings, and that's going to be vitally important, both waste rock and tailings. 
And I think uh, that's something that we need to drive towards to get more full value, more complete value from what we do in terms of mining. And of course, recycling will play a role and an increasingly important role, but we have to be realistic. It's not going to solve that gap in the data that I showed you before in terms of, uh, in terms of supply and demand, at least in the, uh, in the immediate short term. And lastly, come back to this waste question of how we reprocess process waste and so on. This is a, a slide from a company that recently formed called Regeneration that's going to reprocess waste, rocks, tailings, whatever, try to recover the metals from these and then use that, that money, if you like, the revenue from that to help do a complete job of rehabilitation and reclamation and at the same time providing community benefits. So it's a way, hopefully, to accelerate the recovery from the legacy sites, the thousands of legacy mining sites, which give the mining industry a bad name across the world, and find a different way to try and get to solving them rather than waiting for government to come along and, and clean up the mess from the past. So very ambitious, not easy, very challenging to do this in terms of recovering metals from these some of these waste materials, but a very important effort. And this is a regeneration is a benefit corporation, so a different business model, as well as being a different uh, technical way to go about treating our, our, our old mines. So just to, to wrap up here, I've been talking about increasing metal demand. The evidence is, is very clear for increasing demand. The drivers are the energy transition, the need to meet sustainability goals and climate change mitigation. So it's really important that, that we can achieve that even in the volatile world that we're existing in and living in at the present time. Critically, we need to focus on quality. So we need quality resources. And we, once we've found them, we need to work even harder to enhance the quality of the resource. And that's, this is both a technical question, obviously technically very challenging, but it's also a social question. We have to be able to produce and provide quality benefits to all people who are close to or involved in, in our mining world. That requires new discoveries. And it's, uh, it's fine that we can add to existing mines and we will continue to do that by expanding resources and reserves, but we need new discoveries and we need them in a rapidly changing world. So we've got to focus again on how do we do that? How do we use data, whether it be regional, district or deposit scale? How do we actually use the observations, the fertility indicators and the other tools that we have and then combine it with data science in order to do the most efficient job we can of exploring. And that's what it's all about, is trying to get to discoveries more rapidly, more effectively, and more cheaply than we have done hitherto in the past. All of this translates, in my view, into an evolving world for economic geology. It's a world littered with new opportunities for, for economic geologists and earth scientists more broadly, who can apply their, their knowledge and their understanding to all these different pieces of the, uh, the puzzles. So these new and emerging opportunities, they, they translate into changes for economic geology, changes for society of economic geology. It's a society that has to adapt and also meet these, meet these new opportunities and new goals. And critically for the economic geologists who hopefully are listening to this, if you're young now, economic geology is just this massive world of opportunity. And I, for me at least, it's just incredibly exciting and I, I hope you think it is too. So thanks very much. Thanks, John. There's lots to follow up there in the Q&A, I think. And, you know, just a reminder for our participants, if you have a question now, you don't have to remember it, you can type it into the Q&A and we'll get to it later. And so I just wanted to, I, left, I threw this last slide up just in case you hadn't been mind boggled enough by everything I said. Here's all the things an economic geologist should worry about. So that's, a, that's <laughs> just a lead in for Sarah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. I like your word cloud there. While I'm sharing my screen, so I can introduce introduce Sarah. Right. So, having completed her PhD at Imperial College, Sarah went to work as a geologist for Anglo American. She was lucky enough to live and work all over the world in a variety of functions, from exploration through to sustainability, risk management, and assurance. This grounding allowed her to explore different risk management techniques and uses, applying them to real situations. Sarah co-founded co Sotarla in 2014, now with 90 associates based globally in offices in London, Sydney, Johannesburg, and Toronto. Sotarla provides risk management consultancy training and research to organizations from sectors such as healthcare, agricultural charities, finance together with petrochemicals, 
energies, oil and gas, and mining, specializing in making risk management practical and accessible to all those that, you, that use it. So Sarah most enjoys projects through which a company's culture can be evolved to meet its values and purpose. In recent years, this has focused on integrated risk management with a focus on environmental, social, and governance threats and opportunities. In 2020, Sarah co-founded the not-for-profit Responsible Raw Materials with the mission to create integration across raw materials value and supply chains. Responsible Raw Materials runs a series of events and research projects through which those with an interest in minerals and metals vital to the green industri industrial revolution can learn from one another and identify opportunities for improvement. Sarah is an honorary lecturer, lecturer at Imperial College London and research associate at the University of Johannesburg. Voted as one of the top 10 most inspirational women in mining in 2016, she is also a trustee of Geology for Global Development. Thanks, Sarah, on to you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. It's, it's very intimidating having to speak after these introductions, isn't it, John? Um, but absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, so from my end, it's a great privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, I come to you from something called the Wood Hotel, which is somewhere in Sweden. Um, but you'll be glad to know that despite the fact that there are 20 stories built of wood, which is absolutely fantastic, there is still some metal that has been used within this within this building. Um, so this is something here where, um, excellent, I will just start sharing my screen now. If any of you want to follow along with the slides that I'm going to be using today, the link that I've just popped into the chat will provide you with a download. And also there's some extra little fact sheets as well that might be able to help you with this. So I'm going to attempt to build on what John has shared with us, um, where he gave the most phenomenal overview <laughs> with regards to our needs um, for all of these minerals and metals and the, and the role of an economic geologist within all of this. I'm going to build on this and really enhance those sustainability or those ESG aspects. Um, and the reason for doing this is, as already touched on by John, every successful mine requires three things. So firstly, and of course, I'm totally biased by this because I'm originally a geologist. So every successful mine, of course, does need some lovely rock in the ground. There's absolutely no point if the, if the rock's not there in the first place. And of course, those technical skills to be able to extract and process that rock. Second thing, we actually need the demand for whatever it is we're digging out of the ground. And as John showed, the projections for the volume of minerals and metals that we need going into the future is just, just phenomenal. Um, for normal materials such as copper, for example, just for the energy transition, it's estimated we need probably a what, seven-fold increase. For something like lithium, there are projections that talk about a 70-fold increase in the volume of material that is um, extracted from the ground. So we need the rock in the ground, we need demand for it. But then there's this little guy up here. So this licensed operate, this is where the sustainability sits. And what we've seen over the, the last few years is a real increase in the importance that is placed on the licensed operate. It is not something that's new. We have been doing this for a long time. But it is a case here where we really, really, really need to make sure that we've got our hands around sustainability and we understand what this means as mining companies in order to make sure that we extract the material from the ground in the most responsible way. So what does all this mean? Well, if we take a very simple value chain from a mining perspective, going from exploration through the building of a mine into operation and then out into closure, um, if we're lucky enough to be in exploration geology, it's with us where we have all of these options, okay? What mining methods might we think about using here in the ground? What are we actually gonna dig out the ground? Are we just going after the copper? Or are we also interested in things like the molybdenum, et cetera, as well? So what else do we actually want to extract from that particular resource? When we're sitting here as exploration geologists, we have all of these options laid out in front of us, which is really, really exciting. The second thing to note, though, is that generally the ownership of these assets changes hands. It's very unusual for something that is, is found by an exploration team for it to stay with that company or certainly with that team of people as it progresses through development stage into full blown operations and then on into closure and what happens next. So often the ownership of those assets changes with time and also perhaps the objectives of those teams who are looking after those assets also changes with time. More on that a little bit later. 
And that is underpinned, and I'm being potentially a little bit rude here, in terms of what has the traditional focus been of those different teams. So being very generalist about this. So as a geologist, yes, of course, I care about the environment and society, but I really like the rocks. And so therefore, some people might say that traditionally, as an exploration team, we have predominantly thought about the rocks. Okay, I mean, that's what that's what we're trained to do. That's our that's our superpower is understanding what's going on with those rocks. And then we realize, oh, hang on a second, I need a little bit more money to buy some more walking boots or whatever it might be. Um, so I can go back and take a look at the rocks again. And then, oh, hang on a second, I now need to think about the environment because I need to get some permits in order to be able to mine. Now, that is a, a very, very generalist view, but there are examples where people haven't really started thinking about the environment or the community aspects, for example, until really quite late on within exploration. And as you'll see through the course of this talk, um, ESG and sustainability start right at the very beginning of all of this. I spend a lot of time working with exploration companies and they usually come to me and say, oh, we're too early, you know, we're too early for ESG, which is utter rubbish. ESG is very much part and parcel of what all of us need to be doing as economic geologists all the way at the beginning of exploration. And then, of course, as John um, alluded to, the time horizons with regards to all of this are quite vast. There are lots of things that we can do to shrink some of these time horizons. Um, but I spend lots of time as well working with different governments around the world. And for example, in the UK, where I'm originally from, the UK for the first time ever has published a critical mineral strategy. It was published in July 2022. Um, and one of the reasons why they published this is that they suddenly realized that, hang on a second, if the UK is going to meet any of its climate change targets, we need to have access to huge volumes of minerals and metals. And yeah, it might take at least 30 years to go from tripping up over that particular rock in the field through to opening a mine to be able to extract that material out the ground. Now, my maths isn't that great, but we're 2022 now. We need to be fully net zero by at least 2050. Oh, hang on a second, we're too late already. So what does this mean? Lots of things need to change here if the energy transition is actually going to be a reality. Now, if this is a kind of traditional view of a mining value chain, one of the first things that perhaps has really been changing over the last few years is this concept of closure. Um, now, there are lots of closure conferences around the world, which are absolutely fantastic. But actually, with regards to that asset in the ground, it's not really about closing it and then devolving our responsibility for what has been going on there. It's more about thinking, well, what happens after we finish extracting the material from the ground? And that includes things like reprocessing of tailings, et cetera, et cetera. But what is all of this benefit to society and the environment that we're thinking about? What does this actually look like? And then we can take this a step further and say, well, hang on a second. Whilst we call ourselves the mining sector, and, and again, a lot of the focus and the excitement is around the hole in the ground. And what do we, you know, how do we extract that? copper again or whatever it might be actually mining itself is just a really large construction project that allows us to unlock potential unlock wealth for a more developed future for that particular bit of land now as soon as we start thinking of ourselves as just one big project and this is all the way through the mining all the way out the other side once we've extracted the value of what is in the rocks beneath our feet and thinking that's not what we're aiming at we're not aiming at making money from extracting that material out the ground beneath our feet we're actually our real objectives are aiming at what do we produce for the long-term future with regards to the people and also with regards to the environment and this is the really exciting bit, because what it means is when we start talking about value, of course, at the moment, all of what we create in the world round about us is valued in terms of money. And when we're talking about a mining project, OK, the real value traditionally comes when we are extracting that material out the ground and we're selling it. Until that point in time, we're just spending <laughs> a whole load of money. So when we're talking about the financial aspects, the big value phase is when we're extracting that material out the ground. But money isn't the only way in which we measure 
value, especially especially now. So you'll hear lots of people talking about triple bottom lines, three Ps, and I'll come on to that in a second. What does all of this mean? Well, what this means is that we're not just talking about financial value. We're also talking about environmental value or natural capital, what, what is involved with regards to that, and also social capital as well. So how do we involve these different aspects of value into what we're doing and what you can see here and these are very crude wiggly lines that have no numbers behind them whatsoever it's truly theoretical is to say from an environmental aspect when we're actually physically mining we are going to be damaging parts of the environment because we are altering that patch of earth but there is absolutely nothing stopping us from saying okay but when we go through that restoration when we go through that remediation we can <laughs> we can build back better. I feel like a politician using these phrases, but actually we can do a better job in terms of what we're building for the future. So you can see here that that natural value actually goes up. Now it takes quite a long time to get there, but that's what we're aiming at into the future. And the same thing can be said with regards to the social aspects. So depending on where we are in the world, some of the most complicated mining operations in the world are in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example. And the reason why it's complicated is because of the social situation that is there on the surface. Now, that's something where it makes it much more exciting for mining companies, in part because you're usually interacting with lots of artisanal or informal mining. Um, you might have very interesting governance jurisdictions, etc., to be able to deal with. There are some of the most amazing rocks in the world in these locations but this is something where when you are undertaking mining in somewhere like the DRC in fact anywhere but in somewhere like the DRC there is the most phenomenal opportunity as well as threat on the table in front of you and the opportunity is to be able to help to unlock that value from the ground but you've got to make sure that as much as possible of that value especially from the social side goes into that local community or into that particular region. So this is a reframing of what do we actually mean by the mining sector or the raw material sector. It's not all about that big hole in the ground or that lovely underground mining operation, whatever it might be. Actually, it's something here where we are unlocking the potential of the future. And that potential of the future is not just about injecting money, into the economic system. It is also about improving the environment in which we as human beings live. So this is very much what is meant by ESG or sustainability. Now, ESG and sustainability, this is nothing new. Um, so if we go back to the 1980s, um, the United Nations put together a really fantastic paper called Our Common Future. And within this paper, this is where perhaps one of the earlier definitions of sustainability, sorry, sustainable development was coined. And as you can see here, the Brundtland Commission, which was who, the people who wrote the paper, defined sustainable development as being development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this still holds true today, perhaps with one little exception, this word compromising, because actually we have the potential to enhance the ability of future generations to meet their own needs if we do this in the proper way. So back in the 1980s, when we talked about sustainability, we talked about three pillars, social, environment and economics. They mean pretty much the same kind of things as today. But you'll see that the little phrases that um, have been pulled out on this particular slide here, when we're talking about social aspects, yes, we're talking about social mobility, cultural pres preservation, empowerment, etc. On the environmental side, we're talking about biodiversity. Yep, of course, our natural resources are in there ecosystems, integrity, etc. Climate change, not necessarily being mentioned, because again, this is the 1980s, and we hadn't necessarily had the, the realizations, perhaps on the broader scale with regards to what was going on there. And then on the economic side, the economics bit is the difficult bit, because sometimes people interpret economics as just profit and making money. But actually, what we're talking about is really the distribution and the use of resources. Okay, so it's much 
It's a much deeper aspect than just making money. So this is what sustainability looked like when people were talking about it back in the 1980s. Um, shuffle forwards to the 1990s, and this is when John Elkington started publishing papers about the three Ps, so people, planet, and profit, which are remarkably similar to social environments and economics, but these are people coming from slightly different academic and industry type backgrounds. Um, it means the same kind of stuff, but again, we've got this same problem with this word profit. Profit doesn't mean making lots of money in this, it means injecting cash into the social system. And so as a result, a little bit later on, you find that people stop using the word profit and they start using the word prosperity, because that's actually what we're trying to drive here. So you've got this evolution in terms of how we as society are talking about sustainability. This then cycles forwards into 2015 and the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals, obviously being pushed out by the United Nations. Now, the SDGs are fantastic. They are big, big, ambitious goals. I mean, we've got by 2030, having no poverty left in the world, having quality education for everybody, gender equality. Um, we've got sustainable cities and communities, life below water, life on land. And of course, number 13 here is climate action. Now, the key thing with this, especially with COP27 going on, of course, this week and last week in Egypt, is that sustainability only one little bit of it is about climate action. The rest includes a huge variety of different stuff. And so when we are trying to, to understand what does sustainability mean to us, it's not just the climate bit. We also need to be thinking about climate in the context of life on land, good health, peace and justice for all, etc. So this is something here where sustainability is messy and it's complicated and different goals actually conflict with one another. And it's really difficult to wrap our heads around. And so that's where we have this thing called ESG. OK, so ESG is perhaps the latest language that's used, especially by investors in the financial world when they're trying to get their heads around how do we make sustainability real. Now ESG just stands for environment, social and governance. So you'll see there's, there's remarkable similarities to what people were talking about in the 1980s. Um, but there are one or two little tweaks in this. There are some little differences. And the first thing is that traditionally you, you saw people looking at environmental aspects, social aspects and governance in, in their own field. So environmental awareness is generally driven by environmental scientists, social awareness is generally driven by social scientists and governance is, is generally driven by lawyers would be the traditional way of thinking about it. But actually ESG is much more than that. And it requires us to bring these three areas together in order to be able to give it momentum and to give it teeth. And so what do we actually mean by ESG? So the E is indeed about the environment, it's about nature. It's about being stewards of the land. It's about protecting and optimizing our planet and it's about creating balance in the environment in which we're working. Lots of our mining operations are facing really big question marks at the moment because we're going through restoration or rehabilitation. And the problem is that the vegetation that would naturally grow on those mine sites now is different to what would have grown there before we started digging stuff out of the ground maybe 10, 20, 100 years ago. So what does this mean? Because our climate, of course, has changed. What does this mean in terms of finding the right balance within those ecosystems? So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about when we're talking about the environment. On the social side, of course, we're talking about people. And the big thing here is trying to, where possible, making sure that people have a choice so they can choose what it is that they actually want to do with their lives, with their careers, what do their children want to do, etc. So when we're thinking about society, a lot of it is about choice. It's about treating one another with dignity and respect. And of course, it's about unlocking human innovation to say, well, actually, yeah, how do we work with a changing climate, for example, okay, what does this look like going forwards? So that's uh, the kind of the, the sort of interpretation of what do we actually mean by the social aspect of ESG. And then we come into the cultural aspect, or I should say the governance aspect. Now, sometimes I speak to people and they think that governance is just about project governance. OK, making sure that, yep, OK, we've got the start of a project and then we've got to hit various milestones and then we, we get to the end of it. And that's that's one interpretation. But really what you see when people are looking for good quality ESG is really they are looking at the culture 
of an organization. And within that, they're looking to say, okay, we have committed to various different environments, social, but also economic, um, technological, et cetera, goals. Are we holding ourselves to account in terms of delivering that? Do we trust ourselves and do other people trust us? Do we trust them in terms of being able to deliver this? And of course, there is an, an element of underlying compliance that's in there as well. So ESG as a whole concept is much, much deeper than just saying, OK, I'm going to tell you what my, what my carbon emissions are. We're going to give a little bit of money to charity. Oh, yeah. And we're going to comply and pay our tax. That would be a very superficial interpretation of ESG. As you can see from this slide here, it is something that is much, much, much deeper than that. Now, having said that, when we look at ESG from a mining sense, things that we're generally looking for would be things like how are we using the land? What are we doing with regards to biodiversity, nature conservation? How are we going to be managing our waste? All of these kind of aspects. What are we doing with regards to our water? These are just some of the things that we might think about when we think about the environmental side. On the social side, again, we're also thinking about water in the social bit. So this is where you get lots of overlap between the E, the S and the G. So water is a, is a social thing as well as an environmental thing. But we're also talking about things like um, expectations for shared value. Um, do we want to hire people locally? What about health and safety, both for our own workers, but also other people who might be near and um, round about us as well? And then on the governance side, of course, we're talking about that culture aspect, as I just mentioned, but there are two big aspects of, of governance. One of them is around, OK, so what does the government do in the jurisdiction in which we work? So um, how well respected are they? And of course, different governments around the world um, have different rules and regulations and ways of doing things. Um, but then also as well, how do we run our companies? So what's actually going on with our business ethics, with our business culture? Do we pay our tax um do we do we have diversity at different levels in the organization are we actually listening to people inside and external to our organizations what does all of that look like and what we realize within all of this is that esg is really 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 interconnected okay everything is tied together and if we look at all of these important aspects something that might be the most important risk to one person is actually just the output or the consequence of something that somebody else is um, thinks is important, which in turn, they're just drivers of what somebody else thinks is important. So everything is interconnected and everybody has their own perspective as to what is important. And, and these perspectives, this is where things get messy. These perspectives are then personified in an endless array of ESG frameworks, guidelines, principles. Within mining, somebody told me the other day that there are 150 different frameworks, guidelines, principles, standards that are to do with sustainability that mining companies need to be aware of and adhere to. Now, I don't think there are quite 150 because, of course, it depends where in the world you're working, what kind of commodities you're involved in, etc. But there are a lot. And unfortunately, nobody has written these standards thinking, hmm, I might want to make this easy for somebody to use at the, other, at the end of the day. Um, and so I'm going to align my standard with what somebody else has written. Everybody has written them from their own perspectives because they're trying to provide assurance to their bosses and their bosses might be um, investors or they might be local communities or they might be economic geologists because those people want to know, are we mining in a responsible way? That's what they're actually asking here. And yeah, as you can see, this timeline just goes on and it gets quite eye watering in terms of the array of standards, et cetera, that are out there. And um, if you want to look at quite a good summary of a lot of these standards, a paper that was put together by the Critical Minerals Association in the UK last year includes an appendix that has a really good breakdown of what was there, certainly through to, to this time last year. So with all of these different standards that are out there, are we just ticking boxes or are we truly making a difference? And ticking boxes is greenwashing, okay? Greenwashing is also pretending we're doing something when we're not. And there's an awful lot of that that's out there in the world at the moment. But of course, within mining as geologists, we, we're here to make a difference. We are here to say, we're not just about getting that metal out of the ground. We're here to make sure that we're unlocking that potential for the future. And when we're doing that, we're doing a variety of different things. We are here making sure that when we're actually mining 
itself so our core activities we're doing it in the most sustainable method that we can and of course mining itself is not a sustainable activity okay because we are we have zero intention of putting that copper back where we found it this is something where we are undertaking something that is not truly sustainable but we can use sustainability principles when we are extracting that rock from the ground in terms of our inputs, we can make sure that um, we're exploring and also we are um, using suppliers who do things in the best possible way. In terms of what we're producing, we are meeting that demand that John articulated so beautifully, all of these materials that are needed for the green transition. And then in terms of the external environment round about us, we're perhaps reimagining mining as an industry to say we are stewards of this land and we are here for that post-closure vision and the overarching development so how do we make sure that we are actually creating a difference rather than just ticking boxes with regards to these millions of standards that are out there just because an investor has said that they actually want them so a way of doing this as i just come back to the slide where i was before is to say okay well i could take a view of a lot of my different threats and opportunities that I might face as a mining company or as an exploration organization, whatever it might be. And what I can do with this is instead of using, say, impact against likelihood to work out what the important things are, is I can use impact against do I need to take more action in terms of actually managing this stuff. And this particular view of prioritizing your issues or your risks or your threats or your opportunities is really neat because immediately it says okay am I comfortable with regards to this particular risk now within mining fatalities and health and safety has received an awful lot of attention over the last few decades quite rightly so when I first started working in the sector the organizations would budget to kill people down every mine every month Okay. Now, that is atrocious. We shouldn't be budgeting to kill people or to have fatalities within the mining sector. There's a there's very, very different mindsets in there now. So this is something where once upon a time, fatalities, etc., would have been a risk that required lots and lots of action. We've put in place lots of actions. And as a result, yes, there are still health and safety risks that exist every day when we go out into the field. But they're things that we feel actually, you know, you know what, this is under control. I can tolerate those risks at the moment. Other things, things like tailing stand failure. Okay, so this is something as well where lots of organizations have done huge amounts of work over the last few years to try and bring that risk a bit more under control. Have we cracked the tailing stand problem? Absolutely not. So there's still a whole load more action that needs to be undertaken in order to be able to bring that into, okay, yeah, as an industry, we feel that this is a little bit more under control. Another area that lots of people are talking about at the moment is how do we attract and keep talent within the sector? This is a risk where perhaps if we looked at it last year or a few years ago, it might have been a little bit lower. It is very much bouncing up at the moment. As a sector, we are growing. We also need different talents, different skills, and we need to be able to hold people within the sector. So this now is becoming more and more important in terms of its potential impact on the sector. And we need a huge amount of action to be able to bring this down into a comfort zone where we think, yep, we've got exactly the people that we need in order to be able to deliver on this future. And of course, I can keep going. Don't worry, I'm not going to work my way through all of these different threats and opportunities that I've got on this chart. I threw this, this slide together probably about 45 minutes ago, and I wish that I'd seen John's final slide from his talk, because equally I could have taken every single aspect that he put in his talk and we could have plotted it up here. On, on this chart to say, okay, well, what are all these different aspects we need to think about? And it includes things like acid mine drainage from waste. As, as geologists, we're the ones that characterize all of this rock. Are we planning for that future or are we setting ourselves up for a really, really big problem at some point in time when people wake up and realize that there's a huge problem that's coming here from our waste dumps? What about making sure that we maintain that trust, that respect with our local communities? Um, also, as well, things like inflation. OK, so this is a risk, for example, that has gone from, yeah. OK, we might want to think about it shooting up at the moment across the world. So all of these different aspects, every single one of these has got something to do with sustainability. Some of them you think, oh, no, that's more financial than sustainability wise. But every single one of them touches on something to do with the responsibility and the importance of making sure that we get things right. 
So lots of different things that we might want to think about here. Um, and the final aspect with regards to this chart is this one up here and that I've put in the top right hand corner. Do investors and stakeholders really value what, what it is that we want to do? One of the problems I think that we have in the sector at the moment is we're still being rewarded on money. So we're still being rewarded on showing financial value for the rock that we're finding or extracting from the ground. Those investors are only beginning to think about the natural capital and the social capital and thinking about how do they reward us for doing this properly or perhaps making sure that their investment goes into those more responsible mining companies. That is only beginning to happen. And I was very privileged to be in Australia at the IMARC conference a few weeks ago. And there's been a massive shift in the last year or so in Australia, in that mining sector, where people are going from, oh, it's just a tick box thing to, OK, actually, no, ESG is is real. Um, and if anybody's going to be in London in a few weeks time at the Minds and Money conference there, please do come along and find me because we're running a whole load of dialogue tables to say, OK, from from the London aspect do we think that ESG is real? Or again, is it just a tick box aspect that, that people are thinking about? Now, with all of this, it is all about impact. Okay, it is all about finding where we're putting in place those actions, and we're creating a difference, we're creating change, we are trying to create impact on the ground. And when we're going through this energy transition, it is about a just transition. And so therefore, it's not just about removing emissions, et cetera, from the atmosphere. It's about using this change that we're going through at the moment to unlock this mineral wealth, make sure we're supporting society, et cetera, around about us. Um, and with that, and I'll, I'm will i almost finished, by the way, Lauren, and with all of this, there are a few little aspects that as economic geologists, we actually have the power to be able to deal with. The first thing here, of course, is that we're all about the geology. So what is actually in the ground, seeing if somebody can actually extract it, is there financial value in it, and then making sure we're thinking about these ESG aspects. Now, these ESG aspects, quite handily, are being rolled into all of the resource reserve code updates at the moment. And so lots of you will have seen all of these updates coming through, be it with regards to PERC or, of course, JORC are going for theirs at the moment. And so what we're seeing here is when we're talking about modifying factors, no longer should we see a 43101 with not applicable against the sustainability paragraph because it's always applicable. So what do we mean here with regards to that ESG? Also, with regards to what we're doing, instead of just talking about there being byproducts in the ground, it's actually extracting the byproducts and making sure that they're rolled into our economic models. It's also about looking at our mining technologies and our mining techniques and saying, yeah, we can provide carbon sinks whilst we're actually mining. Well, let's do it. Rather than just talking about it, let's get on and do it. It's about those of us or those people who actually procure our minerals and metals from us saying, OK, this is what we expect of you and making sure that those expectations are real and are also enacted as well. And that includes both customers, but also markets such as the London Metal Exchange. Our investors are beginning to get there. OK, they're coming. And if your investors aren't already asking about ESG, they will be very, very, very shortly because they have to because they're reporting to their own bosses. And finally, within this is about seeing the role of raw materials extraction. We are part, we're an engine within that circular economy, but we're not the only bit within it as well. Of course, we require everybody else to come to the table and do their bit to design cars so that they can be pulled apart and those bits that wear out to be put back into that vehicle again, or they can be recycled. At the moment, with regards to the recycling of steel, the lowest quality steel is the steel with all of the contaminants in it. And when you look at the chemical compositions, rebar, so that really dirty stuff that goes into you know, the guts of buildings, it has 0.38% copper in it, 0.41% nickel, which is astounding. We'd open up brand new mines just for that. So this is something where the world of recycling needs to get its act together to improve what it's doing. There are endless tools out there for us to be able to use. And as economic geologists, it's in our hands, it's within our gift to make use of that, to make sure that when we're talking about the world round about us, our little bit, which is that world of mining, is done in a truly responsible way. 
So with that, I shall hand back to the lovely Laura. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And I think we've had a couple comments pop up while I'm sharing my screen, asking if you know off the top of your head, um, a specific example of a company or a project that you know improved improved the state of things after restoration. So the the environment or the location was actually improved by the mining company being there rather than maybe just flattening out the pit and sticking a few shrubs on top. <laughs> um absolutely. And I mean the 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 best the best examples i'm sure john's got some up his sleeve um as well um and and the thing with this is that um actually making sure that you're planning for all of this and you're working with the local community um often to create um, different social enterprises so that when the mining stops there's still economic benefit that's rolling into that society and that might well be through through those shrubs <laughs> or whatever it might be that ha have been planted um but i mean john I, I saw you get quite excited by that question i might just <laughs> unashamedly throw it straight across to you <laughs> uh, th thank you sarah um i mean we have to be honest first up and and admit that the vast majority of cases it has not been done well and uh, that, that's why we have so many legacy sites around the world that uh, haunt us and haunt the mining industry and communities and people so that we have to address those but fortunately there are examples of where it has been done well you know, one is close to where I live in uh, Western Canada was uh, the Sullivan mine. Sullivan was a major lead zinc mine, underground lead zinc mine, operated in the Kootenay region of southeastern British Columbia uh, for 100 years, more or less. In incredible mine in many respects and, and quite challenging. And it was closed about 10 to 15 years ago, something like that now. And the town of Kimberley, which was the mine town, was completely sort of reconstructed as an enterprise to become some more tourist and environment regional environment focus and so on <clears throat> the mine was reclaimed the 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 weight shop pile is now a solar farm and um, providing solar power to the town of town of kimberley and i think you know, the vast majority of people think that it has, it has been a resounding success i'm sure there's that there are warts in it but there'll be things oh john your sound's gone out or it might be just me. Yeah, I can't hear John either, unfortunately. We could we could we could give him a sound a voiceover with regards to what he's saying at the moment, Laura. <laughs> 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 well, I think he's answered it very well. I mean, why he while he's he's sort of figuring out his sound. I think that there's a lot, you know, Sarah and John, you'll say this, but um you've said this in your talk, but there's a lot to the idea of you know, what value are we, we creating, really? I mean, how do we measure that in terms of everything that a mining project may give us down the line? Sorry about my my, my sound just jinxed for some reason. I don't know where I, where I was at in that amazing spiel, but it was, it was probably just as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was very good. You were talking about sort of, you know, I guess we, especially since I live in Colorado, you know, I'm very familiar with the idea of ghost mining towns. But if you can have an operation which once it ceases to be an op a mining operation, doesn't just, you know, sort of leave that town high and dry and abandon that to no longer have, you know, a local economy, then you've got an example of something that maybe made the place better for its being there. Yeah. So just on that, I mean, I think the question in the, in the Q&A is to refer to it being better. So better is a, is a difficult thing to define. Um, and, I, and actually, even restoration is a word that I don't like to use because I don't think as a, that a mine can ever restore 100% to what it was exactly before. I mean, there are a few cases. There's a small mass of sulfide in Wisconsin that you wouldn't know was there because uh, it, was, it, was, it was a relatively small operation. Flambeau, thank you. Somebody just put it in the, in the, in the chat there, mm -hmm. which, was, which was a, is a fantastic example. You would not know that the mine was there, but it was farmland already. So it was already, if you like, disturbed land, and it's restored to land. It's farmed and mixed. So there's, there's now a tourist area there and bike trails and all sorts of things. But it's not, so restoration is where we can't, we have to sort of move from on. And we need to talk about how we can rehabilitate completely to the natural environment, providing an ecosystem that was the same as far as possible, making sure there's no effluent. All those things are what, are what we can and should do. And there's plenty of examples. And one of my favorites, I'm just going to tell you this very briefly. You know, we don't like, as economic geologists and perhaps the world in general, we, we are a little uncomfortable with coal mining and, and the use of coal. And that's fair enough in a, in a world that's worried about climate change. 
but the coal mines, the big strip coal mines in Wyoming do an amazing job of, of reclaiming the strip as they move forward across the country. They actually save the topsoil, they bring the topsoil back, they measure the biodiversity in the material they've moved and they restore to that biodiversity in the, in the sort of terrain that they reestablished as they move across the country. So even coal mines, you know, do can do fantastic work and so on, even if we have don't feel completely comfortable with why they're doing it. And I think just to build on that, John, so this is something where it's not just about um, you know, planting vegetation and that that kind of environmental rehabilitation. It's about saying, okay, hang on, in order for us to be able to extract that coal or that lithium or whatever it might be, we need to undertake really significant earthworks in order to be able to do it. So actually because we've got to move all that rock around anyway, what's best? What is the, the best opportunity for the future in terms of that balance? Do we want to just put it back? Or actually, do we do we want to build a town on top of it? So therefore, we're moving all the rock around anyway. Do we then put stuff back so that it's ready for those foundations or the undergrounds or or whatever's coming in the future space. And so that's something as well where, yes, of course, there's nothing more precious than virgin forest, et cetera, as well. And again, we're seeing lots of really exciting um, chatter from the new Brazilian government, or I should say the, the new old Brazilian government with regards to the protection of the Amazon, et cetera. But this is something here where actually saying, you know, we, we've now got 8 billion people on our planet. That's a, that's a lot of people, all of whom want to eat. So perhaps actually saying, OK, rather than just putting it back to where it was, can we optimize that land to be as fertile as possible and to grow food? So this is a case of really seeing, again, mining as an opportunity because we've got to move the rock anyway. Do we need to put it back or could we do something better going into the future? Now, unfortunately, a lot of our regulations don't like that because they all say put it back. But we all have the opportunity to engage with governments and regulators and gently say, actually, there may be a better way of doing this. So how do we do this within balance? Yeah, no, I mean, that requires policy changes. And I agree, I think policy sometimes is out of sync with reality. And, and this is a case, I mean, we as an industry, we're bad at closure. There's no doubt about that. And we need to, and people fortunately are thinking a lot more about it. But we not only need to do a good job of closure in terms of mitigating issues, we need to be creative about how we do that to generate prosperity for, for lasting prosperity for communities and people who live in and around those sites. And the regulations actually don't make that necessarily don't make that easy. Um, you know, in, in the case of this company regeneration, you know, and other companies that want to go in and reprocess material, you know, at the moment the liabilities are such that they would inherit the low liabilities once they start moving stuff around to try and do good things. And obviously, therefore, they don't do it. So changing policy that allows and encourages people to actually go in and deal with difficult problems for a better outcome for the people around them are, are, is very important. So there's a, you know, the industry is bad. Yes, we're not good at closure, but we also need other people to think about what can make us better in, in addition to doing a better job ourselves. Well, and I suppose this gets at just sort of the just scientific literacy, but also the literacy of economic geology and mining in the public, right? Because we can't all be the, we might, you know, be talking within an echo chamber where we say it's important to lobby to our politicians for policy change, but everybody as a, a citizen of society, our society has the, has the ability to do that. And I suppose this is where we get into the conversation that, you know, geologists usually have of, you know, how good are we, how good are we at teaching this to people? But I want to get on to, um, you know, other questions. Uh, one that's been upvoted in the chat is sort of when we have these conversations about the importance of critical metal, metals and elements in the future of energy, we often focus maybe solely on energy storage, so better efficiency storage, storage by batteries. But we still need to talk about energy generating options, and there may be maybe a reluctance on our part to, to talk about this this part of the equation. So when we consider things like nuclear energy, a capacity factor of 92%, um, geothermal, whereas hydro, wind, and solar all have lower capacity factors. Um, what, are we, what is uh, your opinion, John and Sarah, about, are there any thoughts as to whether nuclear and geothermal electrical generation should be included in these discussions? Absolutely. Go, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to understanding energy and you know, meeting goals of sustainability, everything should be on the table. So there should be no exclusion. And that even includes some things that we uh, still have to deal with, like coal and oil and gas, that over a period of time will diminish. But we have to deal with them now. So everything is on the table. And that would include, absolutely include geothermal. Geothermal is, is, a, is a great source of energy, but both for so local heating and also for power generation. And that, uh, that, should, that should be on the table. And I, 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 I'm a big fan of wind and solar. And yes, they have their own issues and that we have to address in terms of sources of material and what have you. But, but, the, but the input to them once they're done uh, is free. So yes, it's a capacity factor in the 30%, 35%, whatever. But the input is free, it's the wind. So I think we can get over that. And as for nuclear, you know, one of the things that's under discussion in the world right now is small nuclear uh, uh, reactors. SMRs, uh, SNRs, which would be you know, the idea being that you can put a small reactor into a community in northern Canada, say, and get them off diesel. And that's not a bad thing. And small nuclear reactors are extremely safe. So they are a realistic option. I mean, we have ships going all over the world with small nuclear reactors and submarines. So if we can have people willing to go in a submarine with living next to a small nuclear reactor, I, I think a community could probably do that if they wanted to. And obviously, the, if they wanted to is a very, very important part of that, that equation. Um, and, but the issue on nuclear, the one, the hairy part, is, is the waste. And small nuclear reactors still generate waste just like big ones do. And if we have hundreds of small ones, we'll actually end up generating more waste than we would if we have just a limited number of very big ones. Um, so you know, everything should be on the table. Everything has to be looked at, has to be looked at from a full sort of life cycle you know, analysis capacity. You have to really understand the, the benefits versus the impacts, but it, everything should be looked at. That's my view. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it's all about systems thinking. And, and actually being able to see the, the whole thing in its entirety. And that's why we talk about the energy transition. It's not something we cannot, we cannot just stop burning coal today and think that the lights are still going to come on tomorrow. As we found within Europe, that doesn't work because somebody also turns the gas off as well. And, and also as well, so I've spent most of the last couple of years living in a little off-grid hut in the northeast of Scotland. And it is really difficult <laughs> <laughs> to live off grids in the north of Scotland because there is hardly any sun, especially in the winter time, and the wind doesn't always blow, and the water freezes in the hydroelectric system, and then your batteries get really cold and they lose all their charge. And then you think, okay, I'm just going to have to, I don't know, have some sort of cycling bike generator, and that's my way of, of producing power. And so you get really inventive. But the thing with this is actually having diversity of supply of that power um and and the reason why at cop 27 they will be talking about oh no we can't say no to coal is because a huge amount of the world's population still needs it but the fact is we need to be able to burn it in a way where we are capturing those emissions we're looking at cleaner coal techniques etc as well so facing up to what is reality rather than full ambition because it is a transition it is not a cliff edge that we're going through with regards to all of that. But great question there. Yeah, and I think that that, Sarah, you've brought up a good point, which is that, you know, in, in a developed nation or in the developed country, where we start thinking about, well, how can we cut back and how can we consume less and how does that, that piece enter into sustainability? Um, but of course, there are people all around the world in developing nations who want cars and they want electricity. <laughs> And they deserve those things. And we can't just say, well, no, for the greater good, you can't have them. But when we look at mining and ESG conflicts in, you know, in different parts of the world, often it's not in, in my backyard and people don't want it to be. But we look at uh, countries and we have to ask ourselves, well, you know, is there any place that's off limits? And then, and a question that that popped up in the chat is, you know, uh, we often refer to a greater demand for metals and uh, you know, the push of advancements of projects to kind of justify this, but it doesn't always work for indigenous populations. So for example, they're in the Bornite project in Alaska, they're looking towards building a road, but the indigenous population is against it due to the concerns of distri um, disturbing the caribou migration. So these communities don't rely heavily on the metals like the rest of us do, yet the project disturbs their livelihood. Where do we draw the line in saying, you know, do benefits outweigh the risks? And I guess overall is a question, what is our limit? Where do we draw the line and say that this project should or should not proceed 
even though as economic geologists, we know we need those metals? Absolutely. And this is a great question. And it's not just indigenous communities who turn around and say no. So I'm currently in Sweden, in Europe. And when was the last time that a new mine was opened in Europe? Okay, when will another one be opened in Europe? Currently within the European Commission, and I'm probably going beyond the bounds of what is safe to say in a public webinar, okay, but the European Commission is going more and more and more towards we don't want any mining within Europe because they don't trust the industry to be able to do it in a socially and an environmentally responsible way. And so Europe, from a trade perspective, is signing all kinds of agreements with other countries around the world saying, OK, Chile, yes, we'll buy lots of your copper. Now, once upon a time, that would have been called colonialism. Now, this then brings to the fore a really, really interesting question. We all live on the one rock that's called planet Earth. How do we make sure we extract this material in a way that is is responsible and I think that this is that there are lots of really good research projects that are going on at the moment to say okay within the European context how do you make sure you do it in a way that that is palatable that does actually work for everybody that treats everybody with huge respect listening to people who don't think that we need mining at all fine everybody is entitled to their perspective through to people who have made big mistakes, for example, in the past. How do we bring all of that together? And so there's loads of really great learnings there. Um, and yeah, if somebody doesn't want a, a road going through their backyard, they are perfectly, perfectly entitled to say, I don't want that going there. But it's all about creating that dialogue and discussion. So people then go, okay, I understand what it is we're talking about and I respect everybody's decisions that are there. Yeah, if I could yeah, just build on that a little bit. Um, absolutely, at the end of the day, you know, people have a right to oppose something, and and right now, you know, communities ultimately have the hammer on these things, regardless of permits and legal requirements and so on. And the indigenous communities is a very important issue for them because they have their their own rights in their own territory and how they are how they feel they should be treated and respected within their within the bounds of their, their territorial rights. Having said that, the indigenous world is extremely complicated and highly diverse, just like every other piece of humanity. And there are indigenous communities who, are, who want mining, are actively involved in mining, are actually developing their own mining companies. There are, you know, in Alaska, there are you know, major resource companies based on the original uh, uh, tribal groups, so like the Nana Corporation, who are 50% owner of, of Red Dog now. Um, you know, so it's the one should be very careful not to paint indigenous as a single entity. It's it's a, it's a you know each community is different and have their own beliefs, demands, needs, and we have to address them. We have to listen to them, and in some cases that means we in future are going to partner with them more and more in mining. You know, those that want to do that, um, as opposed to just handing over some some you know some tick box ticking exercises. We are going to have to be true partners with them in some cases taking the lead and that's going to be totally fine too. So that, that's a whole environment of how we behave and how we operate with communities and particularly indigenous ones, it's very active and very changing. And the key is obviously, is the respect that it has to be built on and based upon. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that. I mean, we don't need to treat any group of people as if they're they're a monolith. Um, and I think we're we're at time for what our, our presentation was set to go to, but if you have time, I'd like to get um, if Sarah and John, you feel like staying on for just a little longer, I'd like to get one question in for, for maybe our student audience. So I know that, um, so we, I think in John's presentation, it was, um, you mentioned it, but the, you know, often university students in economic geology, like you said, they kind of cut their teeth on an ore deposit study. And um, I'm no different. And we focus a lot on the either looking at the models, explaining the models, deconstructing the models, constructing new ones, talking about um, transports and traps. But do you know, do you think that maybe given how the in, how the, in, the industry is shifting, we need to look at more research into ESG, we need to look at more research into um, recovery of from mine tailings. And in, in that sense, would you say, you know, what would you say the opportunity is for university students? Because they probably aren't seeing a lot of this in their undergrad, undergrad classes. Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's not an easy question to answer. So on the, on the one hand, 
anybody, whether it's geoscience or, or some other discipline, they, they want to learn their discipline and they need to be trained in their discipline and they're going to get jobs traditionally based on their skills within their discipline. So earth science, their field skills, their petrology, all the traditional parts that make up earth science is how they are going to be judged. But the environment they're going to be working in is going to involve a vast array of different things. So from the ESG to environment to dealing with communities. I mean, economic geologists, exploration geologists are the first people often to actually meet communities and their, their ability to actually engage and listen and talk to them is going to be very important. And then, you know, yeah, the, the how things are going to be processed, et cetera, et cetera. And the part we touched on a little bit in, in my talk was data science. You know, data science is going to become a big part of our lives and yet very few courses would have data science as a major part of their curriculum in terms of earth science. That's going to change, I think. But the fact of the matter is you can't cram everything into a curriculum. You can't train everybody in everything. So you have to come out with an understanding of what you are good at and perhaps some really deep skills in some piece of the economic geology world, the exploration world. But you have to be open to learning throughout your career about these other things. And you're not going to become an expert in everything. In data science, we're not all going to become data scientists. Some probably don't want to become data scientists, and some might, but you know, it's difficult. But what's important is that we understand what it can do for us and how we can work with data scientists. And that's the real challenge. It's not for us to do everything. Our challenge is to work out how to work with other people who can do the things we can't. And that's a skill that you're going to learn through your career by working in companies or doing pursuing your own research and so on. That ability to collaborate, cooperate, and therefore get to a critical answer is going to be what uh, what makes or breaks you more than the individual piece of skill that you have. Yeah, and I think I think with that as well. I mean, um, geology is 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 an applied science. So this is where we take you know our physics, our chemistry, our biology, our maths, etc., and we actually use it. So just through what we do, we're really good at going, okay, I understand a little bit about the physics and the chemistry and the biology, et cetera, and I'm going to bring it all together and then I'm, I'm going to turn it into something useful. I say this with great pride because my other half is a physicist and he constantly says, oh, you're not a real scientist, Sarah. I'm like, no, but I'm a useful scientist. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so this is a case, um, yeah, just a little bit of insight into my relationship there. Um, but this is something where actually one of the things that we're inherently good at as geologists is being able to pull together the important bits of perhaps even if it's just hardcore science and then being able to communicate it and also being comfortable with uncertainty and saying, you know what, I I don't understand, you know, the theoretical physics with regards to that, but I perhaps understand enough for it to either be dangerous or for me to be humble enough to pick up the phone and speak to my friend who is a physicist to get them to explain it to me as and when I need it. And it's the same kind of healthy respect and curiosity and ability to listen and learn that's needed for things like the environmental aspects, the social aspects, the financial aspects, the engineering aspects, all of that that needs to come together. Um, and so I think that's the first thing is that curiosity and ability to be humble and not be afraid to phone a friend. But the second thing is within universities, actually the onus is on the likes of John and myself and everybody else that's on this call who, who work in industry in different fields. So myself, if anybody wants to talk at, at a university and you want to hear what it's like in ESG, then just say, I'm more than happy, this is dangerous, to, <laughs> to, 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 to you know, contribute into the degree courses because that's what's needed as well. Because within our departments, within our universities, we've got the world's best researchers with regards to the rocks, it is unusual to have the best researchers with regards to social science within a geology department. OK, so this is something as well where either within the university, we need to collaborate with those other departments and I'd say bring in people from the outside world in to, to give those talks. And so so therefore, John, I've just signed you and I up. Um, <laughs> No problem. <laughs> Where do we start? Just, just, I just want to build up very quickly on one thing. You, you use the word uncertainty, and it's so, so true. I mean, we live in a world of uncertainty, and particularly in economic geology and exploration, it's, it, it, is, it is so much uncertainty. And of course, the other side of uncertainty is bias, and we have a two, we have two tons of bias, and we live in a world of uncertainty, which is a kind of a bad combination. And as I've you know, recently learned, or am learning. That's where data science does come in. Data science is a way to start to quantify the uncertainty. It doesn't mean you solve it, but at least you have a better understanding of what your uncertainty is and therefore how to do 
collect the best information to address that uncertainty and decrease the uncertainty as a, as a result. So I, I, I'm a fan, and although it's not my natural inclination, I'm a fan. <laughs> I think that's actually a really brilliant way to, to wrap up and it was well said for the both of you.